A family moves into an old house, but soon discovers they're not alone. When an attempt is made to contact the spirits, evil forces are unleashed, turning all of their lives into a living hell. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Zieglersville is a small community in eastern Pennsylvania, dating back to the 1800s. Lurking in its dense forests, rolling farmland and old cemeteries are centuries of dark and troubled secrets. In 2009, Single mom Debbie Guy and her family arrive at their new rural home. She's bought a 150-year-old house with over an acre of land. Okay, you guys. Debbie's worked long and hard to raise the money to fulfill her dream. That's the first house I've ever owned. It had countryside. It had a whole backyard that I could raise the kids with. It was perfect to what we wanted. I still can't believe it. Debbie's extended family includes her 28-year-old son, David, and 26-year-old daughter, Jody, along with Jody's two young children, five-year-old Zoe and seven-year-old Craig. 17-year-old Nick is also moving in with them. He's been close to Debbie and her family all his life. What do you think, Zoe? I love it. Debbie has a full-time job as a hospice caregiver, but intends to spend every spare minute transforming the rundown house. I knew I wanted to redo the whole place, so that's what I had in mind when I bought it, was to remodel the house. I'm going to pick out my room. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to pick out my room. Don't worry, I'm going to make sure everyone has their own room. Can't wait to get started on this place. David is immediately overwhelmed by a strange feeling. Are you okay? Yeah, this is, I don't know, it's kind of funky in here. I remember it being pretty, pretty sudden. Just the, the, the feeling of thick air. You know, the feeling of something else being there besides us. We can open a few windows, air it out. That'll help. Sure. As days pass, seemingly normal activities take on an ominous air to David. <laughs> Zoe? At first, it was childish things. You know, just little things. Hmm. Where could Zoe be? Well, she's not on top of the bed. Maybe she's under it. There's nobody there. We didn't look at it as it was ghosts. We just knew that something wasn't right. While David is puzzled by the odd occurrences in the house, Debbie remains committed to restoring her new home to its former glory. The light up in that room would just turn on and off. Over the following months, Debbie, like David, finds that objects have mysteriously moved on their own. She begins to think that a spirit inside her house is responsible. You can put a piece of paper down and turn around and go for that piece of paper, and it's not there, and you'll find it somewhere else. 
I would hear the footsteps an awful lot, and it wasn't the kids. We were starting to question what else was there. Nick! Nick, turn that music down! While David and Debbie are confused by what they are experiencing in the house, the changes they notice in their charge, Nick, have them truly alarmed. Since the move, he has become moodier and more secretive. He got distant, wasn't telling me things. He became rebellious with me. I started going through the rooms and going through book bags. Debbie finds a book on witchcraft. What's this? You're getting into something that doesn't belong here. It was not good. What is going on with you? I do not like you drawing on the walls, and that is not... This whole thing is just not cool. And neither is this book. What is going on? You're making a big deal out of nothing. Stop going through my stuff. Is there no privacy in this house? <laughs> Soon Debbie has a far greater concern than the house and Nick. She seriously injures her back while at work as a hospice caregiver and undergoes major surgery. Everything is on hold while she recuperates in a ground floor room. How you feeling? I'm OK. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Can I get you anything? No, I'm good. You sure? Mm -hmm. Debbie's sleep is disturbed by more than pain from her injuries. She was from like the early 1900, early late 1800 era. You could tell by, just by the clothing. It's just like, okay, I'll just close my eyes and she'll be gone. And sometimes she was in a different place. After all of the unexplained things she has seen in the house, Debbie is actually relieved to find proof that the house is haunted. I totally was happy to see that there was something else there, that it wasn't just me hearing things or feeling something. I was like, as long as you don't hurt us and don't bother us, you're fine. She falls back asleep, unaware that the ghost may have other plans in store for her. Two months later, Debbie is recovered and back at work. Now it's Nick who is involved in the spirit world. But unlike Debbie, he and his new girlfriend Alicia are working hard to summon them. The fairy of the narrow sadness. Hey, Leaf. Hi. There was nothing subtle about the change in him. More burnt wax? Really? Everything black. Now all of a sudden he's got candles everywhere. That's got to stop. No more spells. No more seances. Dave. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't you dare deny it. He just felt that there was no problem in it. It wasn't really a big deal. It was a big deal to me. And quit drawing pentagrams all over everything. It's nothing. It's just a drawing. Chill out. We found pentagrams everywhere. David decides to protect both Nick and his mom by not telling her what he saw. My mom was working a lot, so I was trying to handle it the best that I could so that she wasn't drug into it and stressed out about it, as well as being at work and paying the bills. 
I was just cleaning everything up. I never really liked seeing pentagrams on anything, especially in the house where we were living. It's almost like you're asking for it, you know what I mean? Are there any spirits here? Now that David put his foot down at home, Nick and Aletheia seek out a secluded spot to conjure spirits, the local cemetery. Who are you? Make yourself known. We did it. Come on, come on. Go. In Ziegler'sville, Pennsylvania, Debbie Guy believes her family's new home is haunted by a friendly ghost. Theory of Veneris at... But Nick, a teenager who lives with them, has begun to change and develop an unhealthy obsession with the occult. Will you help us? He and his equally dark new girlfriend, Alethea, are attempting to summon a spirit in a cemetery. Nick fears they've unleashed something evil. Go! Come on, come on, come on. Hurry. The teens rush home a mile away. He's out there. But how did he follow us on foot? I better go get David. I remember him saying somebody's standing outside. I'm like, oh, OK. There he is right there. See him? So I look out the window, and there's somebody standing across the street. Yeah, I see him. Just standing there, staring at the house. You guys stay up here. I'll go see what he wants. I looked where it was standing. He was standing. It was gone. I came back in, and he was still white as a ghost. Then he told me what happened. Look. As far as the story with him and the Ouija board, I didn't want to believe it. I really didn't want to think that he invited something in. I was shaken, too, because I seen the person standing out there. Finally, David feels he must tell his mother that Nick has been practicing black magic and has a spirit board to try and contact the dead. I fully explained to my children I never wanted to see one on my property. Kids do not realize what that board does that opens things that you can't close. He put the Ouija board away. He stopped doing some of the stuff. It didn't last long. I've stuck it right in the trash can outside the house. Despite the encounter with the ominous figure and the warnings to stop dabbling with the spirit world, David finds Nick just can't give up his obsession. I went down there, and there he was playing with this Ouija board again. Nick, how'd you find that thing? I just got rid of it. No, you didn't. It's exactly where I left it. Give me that damn thing. Took it right in front of him. Took it, tried to discard it. David decides he simply can't trust that Nick won't root through the trash again. This time, he'll ensure it's gone forever. 
a few days later. Now I'm thinking maybe I'm losing my mind. There's absolutely no way that this is the same Ouija board, no way. David decides to mark the board so he'll know for sure if it returns. So I scraped it up, got rid of it. A few more days pass. I seen that same Ouija board again with, with the mark on it. I was pretty scared to know that it found its way back again. Oh my God. And there it was. I knew we were in trouble. It's not burning. They don't burn. I broke it up in pieces. I threw it away. It seems that every day brings a troubling new discovery. The Nick that Debbie has known since birth, a promising student, church goer, and upbeat teen, has taken such a dark turn. She fears he's spiraling out of control. Tell me what is going on! He did something real bad. Me and Alethea, we cast a spell. A bad spell. We ask you to bring sickness, misfortune, and death. We ask for blood. And so we bring you blood. Blood, blood for, for blood. blood. Blood, blood for blood. Blood for blood. In Ziegler'sville, Pennsylvania, Debbie Guy believes her 19th century house is haunted by a friendly spirit. But she's learning that Nick, a longtime family friend who lives with her, has been trying to conjure up something far more sinister. Despite being warned to stop dabbling in black magic, he's admitted that he and his girlfriend took things to the extreme with an animal sacrifice. He told me about the cat, that they, they offered up a cat. They did some spells for disease, sickness, and death. It's the last straw for Debbie, but she can't abandon the young man she's known for so long. She realizes Nick is deeply troubled. I'm gonna get you the help you need, okay? We have to pack your bags. I need to put him into a place that could take care of him. Where I couldn't, I put him in a facility. With Nick gone, Debbie's grandchildren, Craig and Zoe, no longer have to share a bedroom. Zoe moves into Nick's room. Sweet dreams, love bug. Close your eyes, okay? Who are you? 
So you want to help me paint one of the bedrooms upstairs? Yeah, of course not. Should we let the kids pick out the colors? They would love that. Sweetie, what, what's going on? In the window, there's a boy's face, Jacob. He looked at me. Oh, I think somebody had a bad dream. Zoe. It's the uh, second floor up. There's a boy's face in the window. The boy's name is Jacob. Yeah, you ready for bed? Like, there's nobody out there. OK, sweetie, let's get you back to bed, OK? No, no, I won't. Come on. Jody decides that Zoe and her brother Craig should switch rooms. A few nights later, Debbie checks in on Craig. your blanket behind the dresser. He keeps pulling my blankets off every night. Who, oh, honey? Jacob. Each one of these kids coming up with the same name and just scared the heck out of me because he was very bent on that's who was there. Over the following nights, Craig claims Jacob keeps returning to torment him. We would notice his blankets or his belongings would be shoved behind the dresser or shoved under the bed. Or he'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming, and we started to get worried. David puts his laptop in his nephew's room and activates its camera at night, hoping to see if anything's really going on. David stays up to monitor what's happening. DestinationAmerica.com. He looked at me. A family in eastern Pennsylvania is being plagued by unexplained happenings since moving into their 150-year-old home. Events that have grown more frightening since Nick, a troubled teen, developed an unhealthy obsession with black magic. In desperation, Debbie Guy has sent him away for professional help, but now there's more trouble. Her daughter's two children claim they're being tormented by a spirit called Jacob. Their uncle David has set up a secret laptop camera to find the truth. Come in, Craig. Oh, you all right, buddy? It's okay. It's all right. You all right, bud? David has no explanation for what he witnessed. You okay? The camera overlooked the doorway. So if anybody would have came in the room, it would have caught the person coming in the room. He shows his mother, Debbie, the video. There's got to be a explanation to this. It's got to be something that I'm just not seeing because this is just not possible. But I can rewind it, and it's still there, and it did happen. Debbie's now determined to find some answers. 
I decided I'd start trying to figure out what was going on in the house. So I went to the Historical Society for information. There's quite a few places up in the area that are all wanted. The house is 150 years old. Three people owned my home prior to me. We all came from Limerick, Pennsylvania. Debbie discovers that several former residents died in the house, including a young girl whose name she can't make out and a boy named Jacob. It scared the hell out of me because it's real. This little boy did live there. And the little girl. The details of their deaths remain a mystery. All other official records were destroyed in a fire. It's a time of uncertainty for Debbie. She retires from her healthcare job, and her son David is moving out. Well, it's the last one. I'm gonna miss you, honey. I had gotten a girlfriend, and I felt it was time I needed to move on. It's not an easy decision for him. I was concerned for the kids. Mainly for the kids. Be safe. Yeah, you guys too. Debbie's also worried, but feels she has no option but to stay in the house with her daughter Jody and two grandchildren. I couldn't leave, didn't have the finances to, to leave, and we were stuck. There was just no choice. We were stuck. We had to stay there. When Jody and the kids leave for a weekend away, Debbie decides to try to rid the house of its ghosts. He maketh me to lie down beside the still waters. Through the power of prayer. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Take Debbie struggles to make sense of the frightening attack. It growled at me, and it scratched me, and then it pushed me down the steps. <laughs> Packed my bags and I left for the weekend. You won this one. Growing increasingly desperate, Debbie turns to her local church for help. Hi, Debbie. How are you? I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming, and thank you for um, believing me. I do believe you, Debbie, and I'm glad you trusted me. It was scary to let somebody in on something that we hid, but it was nice to know that somebody didn't think we were crazy. Well, why don't we pray, and let's bless this house, OK? OK. I bless this house in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He started cleansing the house. And I got violently sick. Oh, oh. Debbie? He thought that I was personally getting attacked. You're being attacked. Oh. Pray with me, Debbie. The Lord is my oh. shepherd. I shall so not want. It. He maketh me lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of the righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So let's finish blessing the house. Okay. The air lifted in the house, like somebody opened a window, and you could breathe. Of the Holy Spirit. It was peaceful, and it seemed good. For the first time, the house feels normal to Debbie. After keeping others away when the house seemed haunted, she finally feels comfortable inviting friends over. So there are no more problems? There are no footsteps, doors opening on their own? Oh, it's unbelievable. It just stopped. So do you think that they're gone? 
You two are a couple of idiots. There's no such thing as ghosts. Don't talk like that. They don't like it. This house doesn't like that kind of behavior. There's nothing here. I'll prove it to you. Is this where you keep the bad ones? I'm not worried about ghosts, because there's no such thing as ghosts. I told him not to do it. These women are crazy. <laughs> Mr. Ghost! <laughs> these stupid women. I can't believe these. I told you there's no such thing. Debbie Guy hopes her old house is no longer haunted. Pray with me, Debbie. After it was blessed by a local pastor. Bless this house. For weeks, her home has been at peace. There are no more problems? That's unbelievable. It just stopped. But now, a disbelieving friend... It's a ghost! ...has provoked something evil to return. There's no such thing. I knew after I saw that picture that it was back. Oh my God. It was scary as all hell. It was very scary. Debbie contacts the Eastern Pennsylvania Paranormal Society, headed by retired police officer Bill Cook, who agrees to lead an investigation. Our general approach is to try to debunk everything as we proceed with the claims and as we collect evidence using scientific methods. Just our whole approach to doing the investigation is very formatted, very structured. We bought video equipment, still photography equipment, audio recorders. We bought infrared cameras, motion sensors we used as well. Covered the whole house, upstairs, downstairs, the basement. We did look at the door and we tried to recreate it, you know, try to get the happen again, but there was no draft, no windows were open at that point. I guess we'll be starting in the basement. Carrie, come with me. Carrie Moran is a sensitive working with the team. Sensitives can come into an area or a room or around the people and kind of pick up on the energy of the room. They can determine if it's positive, negative, sad, angry, frightened. The basement just felt odd. I'm getting a strong negative feeling down here. Oh my God. Nick and his girlfriend sacrificed a cat there. The sacrifice could complicate the team's ability to remove spirits from the home. The death of an animal or the death of anything as an offering, it's a darker seal on things. It's a more permanent seal on things. It makes it very difficult to eliminate a darker entity when you've taken a life. It's just the worst thing you could possibly do. Upstairs, another member of the team is attempting to record EVPs, electronic voice phenomena. Who are you? What do you want here?
oh my god, it was her. Lot of the basement. So now what? We'll compile everything with a written report for you. I was just looking to document it and see what it was so we could decide how to treat it. What do I do if something more happens? Definitely call us. Debbie Guy has been menaced by spirits since moving into her 19th century home in eastern Pennsylvania. <coughs> Ghosts of two children who died in the house and an evil entity that may have been summoned by her young charge, Nick, continue to haunt her. Soon after an investigation by the Eastern Pennsylvania Paranormal Society, the spirits reemerge with a vengeance. My bed got shook hard. And that was it. The next day, my stuff was packed, and I wasn't going to be in that room no more. The paranormal research team returns for a second investigation led by Bill Cook. My experience was there was definitely paranormal activity. However, I felt there was another you know, negative factor, which I believe was the curse that she claimed that. Uh, Nick had put on the uh, property. The investigators believe the girl and Jacob could be, as Debbie's own research revealed, the spirits of children who died in the house. Yea, though I walk or the something death, more sinister could be trying to fool them. No evil. According to sensitive Carrie Moran. The apparition of a child is oftentimes like a facade, almost like the little actor that comes in, like, I'm perfectly innocent, I'm perfectly harmless, you can let me into your home, and then once they're there, then it's trouble. We had to find a way to counteract that. A few days later, Bill Cook and Carrie Moran return to perform a cleansing ritual with Debbie. This house and these people have been consecrated and freely given to you, God. They say prayers, burn sage, and sprinkle holy water in each room. It's better to do a cleansing based off the homeowner's belief system. So we decided to go with a religious-based uh, cleansing of the house as well as a set script that allows the homeowner to take back their home and say, I don't want you here, get out of my home. My home is now protected by the armor of God. My home is now mine, and you are not welcome here. My home is now mine again. And you are not welcome. How's it feel? It feels better. It does. It feels better. It felt lighter. Debbie seemed happier. Like somebody opens up a window and a fresh breeze runs through the house. Fresh spring breeze just rushes through the house and you smell the lilacs and it's Clean. I feel very confident it worked. I have no reason to think it didn't work, so we feel pretty good about it. There's always a possibility that activity could return because we don't know what's happening after we leave.
the paranormal activity stops. Six months later, Debbie's son David is paying a visit to help out with repair work. Oh my God. Mom! This can't be happening. There, there's no way. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it with my own eyes. What's going on? What? Oh my God. How is this possible? I have no idea. It was on the counter when I walked in. I've heard that many times when people try to dispose of a Ouija board and it comes back. Never seen evidence of it, but um, many claims. They've thrown it away. They burn it, broken in half. They claim to come back again afterward. Maybe it's associated with the energies that become attached to it. I knew we're right back where we started. This time, Debbie does not contact the paranormal investigators for help. She's now convinced there's nothing anyone can do to free her home of its evil presence. But her finances force her to stay in the house with her daughter and grandchildren. Weeks later, when her family's out. Debbie feels a hand inside her chest. Something just reaches and takes the life right out of you. It's strong. It's very strong. This is not good. Debbie is rushed to the hospital, but doctors can find nothing wrong with her. Mom, you cannot stay here by yourself. I'm not going to leave you here. I'm fine. She fears her daughter Jody and her grandchildren are in harm's way and forces them to leave immediately for their own safety. Call me when you get there, okay? okay. At that point is when I told my daughter that I think it was time for them to go and that I might just leave the house, let it go, that I was done. I couldn't protect them. I couldn't even protect myself. They moved out. The house is put up for sale. The hardest decision I've ever had to make. I put every ounce of money I ever had into that house. Everything. I put everything into it. Now, living alone, she still finds that objects mysteriously move. There are strange voices and doors slam shut. Until the house sells, Debbie remains in constant fear of the unknown. A couple buys an infamous Victorian mansion and soon discovers they are not the only ones living there. Ghost hunters try to make contact with the spirits. How long have you been in this house? But unleash demonic forces. Is time running out for the living or the dead? In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. For more than a century, Gardner, Massachusetts has been known as the furniture capital of New England. Moguls like the Haywood brothers and Sylvester K. Pierce made their fortunes here, building businesses and homes that have withstood the test of time. Generations have lived and died within these old walls, 
but some of the dead have not moved on. In the summer of 2008, Edwin Gonzalez and Lillian Otero are looking for a new home in South Gardner. We lived in Boston our whole entire life and then actually came across this beautiful mansion online. And of course, Lillian quickly ran to it because she loves Victoria and she's always wanted one. The house is a historic landmark in Gardner. Okay, here we are. Oh, <laughs> no, isn't it beautiful? It's fantastic. You can really see the attention to detail in a house of this age. I felt like we were going back in time. Like, it, it was just a beautiful Victorian mansion. It was just elaborate. It had all this spectacular woodwork. You can see the stained glass windows. It was built in 1875 by a man named S.K. Pierce. Mm -hmm. He was quite an important figure in town. Built his furniture business from the ground up, and when he died, he was one of the wealthiest men in the county. Lillian was so excited about taking as much photos to show to her family. I, I knew that this was finally an opportunity to, um, to have one of her dreams come true, which is to have a, a beautiful Victorian. She's already set her heart on moving into the mansion. But her photo shoot is cut short when her camera abruptly stops working. That's weird. She noticed that the, the battery light oh, came on, that it batteries. needed new batteries, and she was puzzled because she had just put in brand new batteries. Let me see. Yeah. She stopped working. Hmm. I wouldn't worry about it. You'll have plenty of opportunities to take pictures later. Come on. Wait until you see the the couple floor. brushes off the incident. The way. Right this way. It's beautiful up here. You're going to love it. But soon, Edwin's getting strange vibes. As I toured the whole house, I remember that in certain rooms, I had different emotions. Certain rooms, I felt very comfortable. In other rooms, I, I had like a bad feeling. Wow, now we're talking. I know, right? The windows are amazing. Edward? Just very nauseous. And I thought it was maybe something I had eaten or something. I didn't know. I couldn't understand that. Yeah. That's yeah, I'm wrong. fine. Nothing. Just need to get some air. The minute I stepped out of the room, I felt fine. I'm OK. I'm sorry. I, just, I don't know what happened. Should we, should we go? No, 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 no. Come on, let's finish. I'm OK. Sorry. I still overall thought the house was amazing, and I, and, and I knew that Lillian was excited about it, so I kind of more or less just brushed it off. Edwin and Lillian quickly make a bid on the property. It seems a steal at just under $200,000. Within a matter of months, they've settled into their dream home. Not long after they move in, something captures the eye of one of their neighbors. There's a friend of mine who lives next door. I didn't realize you and Lillian had a son. We don't. I just. And who was that I saw darting between the windows upstairs? Uh, Mike, there haven't been any kids there since we moved in. And he goes, every so often, I see him running back and forth. I see him on these two windows over here. Then all of a sudden, I see him on the other two windows on the other side. There's no way that you could see a little boy on these two windows and all of a sudden see him the other way. He would literally have to go through two walls and a staircase. I guess I'm just tired. Both Lily and I thought, well, maybe he was just seeing something, and we kind of more or less um, really didn't pay too much mind to what he was saying. Weeks pass quietly, and the sighting is all but forgotten.
The door just slammed on its own. Stay there. There was nobody there, but we couldn't figure out what caused the door to slam. These are big <sighs> doors that don't slam on their own. They usually take a lot of force just to swing them. I kind of just try to forget about it, try to relax, and went back to bed. It's 5 a.m. the following morning. Eddie, someone set the door. Hmm? We'll be up this early. Maybe it's the heating guys. What the hell? There was nobody there. You kind of start questioning, like, what is going on in this house? A few nights later, Edwin is alone in his home office. In 2008, Edwin Gonzalez and Lillian Otero have just purchased a historic 26-room Victorian mansion in Gardner, Massachusetts. But their dream home is quickly becoming a nightmare. A neighbor sees a young boy in upstairs windows, but the couple has no children. And now, Edwin is face to face with something evil. When I turned to look, there was no one there. There was nothing there. I think that was a turning point when you physically see something in front of you that you can't explain. It leaves such a deep imprint that all your, what your beliefs are completely has changed. Edwin can no longer deny that something paranormal is going on in his home. In hopes of learning if the house has a history of being haunted, Edwin contacts the previous owner. Hi, my name's Edwin Gonzalez. I'm the current owner of your old house. I don't know how to quite put this. Did anything strange ever happen, or did you ever experience anything weird here? He started telling me about specific things that he knew about the house, the history. He goes, I don't know if you know this, but there was a man who burned to death in your master bedroom. The previous owner tells Edwin to seek out a book called Haunted Massachusetts for more answers. And there was our house. The book's author is paranormal investigator Thomas D. Agostino. The house was built in 1875 by furniture mogul S.K. Pierce. It was built in the course of nine months using 200 workers working around the clock 24-7. It was considered a modern marvel of its time. Shortly after the home was built, S.K. Pierce's wife passed away in the house. It was taken over by his sons, Frank and Stuart, and Stuart later transferred the house to Edward Pierce in 1929. That's be about the time of the Great Depression. He had to find some way to augment their income, so the home became a boarding house around then. There was a bizarre tragedy in 1963 involving a tenant. 48-year-old Eno Sari uh, died in the home the official report was that he had died from smoke inhalation and third-degree burns, but legend has it that he spontaneously combusted. 
That's when I came to the conclusion, the person that I saw was, you know, sorry. Meanwhile, Lillian's at home, alone. Edwin? Is that you, hon? like that, Edwin. There was something growling at me. You do believe me, don't you? I think we need to find someone who knows more about this stuff than we do. Look, this is what I found. Our house is in this book. So our house is really haunted? I don't know. But it's a place to start. That's when I decided to go ahead and reach out and, and speak to, to Thomas regarding his findings. Edwin invites the author to the house to conduct a paranormal investigation. We set up cameras in all the rooms, and we put recorders as well in all the rooms so we can capture any kind of activity, visual or audio. Thomas is accompanied by his wife, Arlene, a spiritual medium. Well, we were looking for EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. OK, you ready? Yes. OK, go. I'm reaching out to Eno Sorry. Eno, are you here? Are there any children in the house with you? Can you show us that you're here with us now? Something kicked the camera in the master bedroom. Hereby banish all negativity from this space. Only positive light. They cleanse the home with sage, a Native American ritual that helps to banish or control spirits. You need to do this every night. You have to assert your authority over this house. Don't be afraid of it. And then we suggested that they cleanse the home in their own way, in their own prayers, in a positive manner, regularly. I felt really relieved, but at the same time, I was also very scared because this thing is for real. Figure it out. Edwin and Lillian take his advice and try to remain positive. A few nights later. Edwin Gonzalez and Lillian Otero are experiencing terrifying paranormal encounters in the Victorian mansion they recently bought in Gardner, Massachusetts. 
Their home is featured in a book of haunted houses. The couple believes there are multiple spirits, including a mischievous boy and a man that burned to death in their master bedroom. Now, something is on the move. Lillian! Lillian! What happened? The door just slammed. I'm dead. I thought there was somebody in here. Come on, let's go downstairs. I want you up here alone. What is that? You hear that? I think there's someone in the kitchen. Nothing broken. What did it all mean is what is kind of like rattles in my mind. What does it mean when the door is closing? What does it mean that the cups are being thrown? Is it one spirit? Is it a series of spirits? Are they angry? Come on. The troubling events in the house are starting to rule their lives. Edwin and Lillian are desperate for answers. Are you the owner of the house? Uh, yeah, you are? My name is Bill Wallace. I knew the former owner, Dave. I'd like to talk to you about your house. OK. The arrival is out of the blue to Edwin. But Bill is a spiritual empath and has visited the house many times before. I knew who he was because the previous owner had told me about having Bill at the house before, and how he's able to communicate with certain entities that are at the house. Oh, she's doing a really good job. Who is? Maggie. He said there was one in particular who was very protective of the house, and she was almost like a motherly figure. She was overseeing everything in the house. For years, Maggie was the nanny for S.K. Pierce's children. She protected them, and now she's trying to protect you. Protect us? From what? From the others, the other spirits. Before Edwin's predecessor bought the house in 2000, it was empty for quite some time. I spoke to him about, have you ever wondered why, after this house being fallow for 20 years, there's no vandalism? That's Maggie. And I just, I thought you should know that. Thank you. Bill has wandered the Victorian house many times before and sensed evil and torment. I knew that there was something nasty in the cellar. I knew there was something nasty on the second floor. I knew there was a child who had been abused terribly in life and was still being abused by somebody in the house as a spirit. We may have to learn to live with this. But if things get worse, what are we supposed to do then? I don't know. Well, I think we should probably get more investigators. Maybe someone can help us figure out what's wrong with this house. Both Lily and I were determined that we were going to make this work. Um, even though we were encountering all these different things that were happening. This is our dream home, and we're not going to give up on it. I'm just not ready to leave then. After 10 terrifying months, Edmund and Lillian decide to hold an open house for paranormal investigators, believing it will help them understand what's happening. We thought it was a good idea because we were searching for answers. So we allowed them to come in. Hey, John. Hey, hey. How you doing? Yeah, yeah no worries. Uh, we're still expecting a few more people. Paranormal investigator John Brightman agrees to coordinate the event. 
I just told him, I have a very strict policy, no Ouija boards. I don't want to be a part of that and have something coming to the house that could actually hurt them even more than what's there. Sanctus. Groups of investigators set up in different rooms. Sanctus. 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 A couple in the cellar breaks the rules by sneaking in a paper version of the spirit board and dabbling in Satanism. Sanctus. 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 Up in the master bedroom, John Brightman is leading another team. I'm going to be starting soon, so, so quiet, please. We were asking the spirit to communicate with us through the different equipment, through the audio recording. We had what we called an ovulus, which is a voice box that actually spits words out that the spirits can manipulate and use. He's trying to communicate with the ghost of Eno Sari, who died in the house. Are you Eno Sari? What year were you born? How long have you been in this house? If I'm not getting a response, I try to be more assertive and push the envelope. You know, I understand you don't like it when strangers sit on this bed. I think I might stay the night here, Eno. What do you think of that? For more A Haunting, go to DestinationAmerica.com. After experiencing a series of troubling events, Edwin Gonzalez and Lillian Otero have invited teams of paranormal experts into their Victorian home. How long have you been in this house? Sanctus, Sanctus. In the basement, two investigators are taking a forbidden approach, using a spirit board to practice Satanism. Sanctus, Sanctus. You know, I understand you don't like it when strangers sit on this bed. Meanwhile, John Brightman and his team have been trying to provoke a ghost to reveal itself. I think I might stay the night here, Eno. What do you think of that? Ah! Something gonna attack me. Oh my gosh. Squeeze every throat in this house. We need to get out of here, now. They got a recording from the obvious box that said, squeeze every throat in this house. Edwin. Yeah. You need to see something. What is it? Oh my. <gasps> there was three large scratches going up the side of his stomach. How, how did that happen? What, what happened in your eye? Something hit me, punched me in the face. I think we need to stop. I don't think this was such a great idea. OK, yeah. I'm going to tell the rest of the groups it's time to leave. In 10 years, the most I've had happen to me is maybe a little tug of a shirt or a door slam on me, hear a voice. That's normal occurrences. But to be physically attacked like this and have something touch you the way it did, it, it's scary. Hey, sorry, guys. I... Open house is over. We need to leave. Now. Nobody really technically helped us. It just basically left us the same way. They came in, they got some evidence, and then they left, and they left us with no answers. After what's just happened, Edwin decides it's unsafe to hold any future paranormal investigation nights and now only allows a select group to visit, including good friend Bob Pfeiffer. So this is where the investigator team was set up. He's hoping for his own ghost encounter. What's that? It's a kiln. 
Kind of like an old oven. Someone actually drew a Ouija board. That's when I knew that the groups weren't really trying to help us out. They were actually just trying to conjure up as much uh, uh, action as they can. I felt a finger go right down my neck. There was nobody there. Are you okay? Yeah. Let's go. Come on. I decided for just a little bit, hang out in the lobby on the second floor, just to see if I could, you know, experience anything. I just remember being in a state of panic and fright, and I didn't know what to do. Bob? You OK? Bob? Hey. You all right, man? Bob? I tried to tell my legs to move, and just, I was not moving. Whoa, 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 whoa. What happened? I think he fainted. Almost fainted. Oh. Is he diabetic? Uh, no, I don't think so. Bob. Bob. Bob? Bob? Are you OK? Bob? Bob? As soon as Lillian touches Bob, he feels normal again. I just remember instantly, just, just like that, I was feeling great again. I think I should go home. Now, Lillian's all alone in the house. Edwin Gonzalez and Lillian Otero are on the verge of abandoning their once dream Victorian home after a series of frightening encounters with spirits. Now, Lillian is under attack. You all right, babe? Just tired. Me too. Come on, let's go to bed. No, I think I'll stay here for a while. You sure? I love you. Edwin notices a dramatic change in Lillian, who becomes increasingly withdrawn and unstable. I was starting to lose her. She was slipping away. I didn't have any answers. I had no one to turn to. I just wanted her to get better. I didn't want her to go through any more pain or whatever she was going through. 
She was becoming more exhausted, sitting in the couch all day long. She wouldn't eat all day. I thought, this is really the house that's affecting her. Lillian continues to grow more and more depressed and withdrawn. Edwin, too, finds himself emotionally challenged by the house. I didn't know if I had just had a dream. I was so overwhelmed with the feeling of sadness and grief, like as though she had lost someone. And the only thing I could relate to that is when my father passed away, feeling that same emotion. And it just happened all over again. Now at his wit's end with all the anguish, Edwin calls in an exorcist. felt that he indeed got rid of a, a very powerful spirit that was at the house. I think maybe we'll be fine now that everything will be back to normal. A few days of peace pass. Hun, what are you doing? Lillian! Hey! Don't touch me! Let me alone! Let me finish! I knew that this was not Lillian, that it was something else that's trying to get a hold of her. Get out! Get out! I knew that this was becoming okay, scarier now because now it's no, using no, her body to make it do something. And I was like, if it's able to do this, what else could it make her do? What is that? She found a newspaper clipping. In the early 1900s, there were several children that drowned on the property. After reading the article, I think that gave an explanation of why we were seeing a child spirit at the house. The way Lillian unearthed this new information does little to calm Edwin's fears about the house. several nights later. Bill. Hi, Edwin. I'm sorry to bother you so late, but it's important. I believe Lillian is in danger. Bill, the empath familiar with the home, pays another surprise visit when he senses a change with the house. She's gone. Lillian's in the dining room. No, not Lillian, Maggie. Maggie's gone. What, what have you done? Maggie, the guardian spirit, wasn't there anymore. He told me somebody had come in and done a cleansing. And apparently led Maggie, the guardian spirit of the house, out the door. And I was mortified. For the very first time ever, I was afraid to be in that house. Lillian? Look who's here. How you feeling, Lillian? In Gardner, Massachusetts, Edwin Gonzalez and Lillian Otero are being terrorized in their 18th century home 
that has been the site of several gruesome deaths. Empath Bill Wallace senses that a ghost called Maggie, who protects the house from evil spirits, was inadvertently driven out by an exorcism. And now, the couple is in danger. Lillian? Look who's here. How you feeling, Lily? There was someone standing behind her with her hand on Lillian's shoulder. He said she's from the Victorian time and that she is trying to harm Lillian. He doesn't care what happens to me at all. He doesn't touch me. He doesn't move me. Lillian was mad. He didn't touch me. He didn't come down to see if I was OK. He didn't do anything. And the more she said it, the deeper the growl got in her voice. Edwin, Lillian really needs you right now. I need to tell you about the couple who lived in this house before you. I knew them, and uh, when I first met them, they were absolutely madly in love with each other. But after two years of living in this house, they couldn't stand to be in the same room together. You can't let that happen to you. We have to fight this. You have to fight it together. That's the only way. Something of Lillian at that moment fought its way to the surface and looked at her husband and saw him. So how do we fight this thing? Well, up until now, Maggie has been protecting you. But Maggie's gone. Now it's up to you. You have to use your faith. I must have said it a thousand different ways. You have to find something to believe in. OK. He says you need to find that and find that quickly. Otherwise, the house is going to tear you down. Are we supposed to live like this? I don't think we can. Should we leave? I don't know. I don't know. just held her and I told her it'll be okay. That's it. We're getting out of here right now. It's one thing that you try to fight it, but when it's affecting the person you love more, yeah, that's when, <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I don't want to see anything like that happen to her. Come on, come on. It's one thing when you could deal with it, but when it's affecting her, like she means everything to me. So I just, I just can't deal with that. So we just left. When I found out that Edwin and Lillian were no longer gonna be living at the Vic, I was just relieved, happy for them, just thrilled that they wouldn't have that kind of a pressure on their relationship anymore. I think it's the best thing they ever could have done. I felt that I could not protect her. That last month, there was too many things that was going on that was affecting us physically, mentally, and it was one after another. It's just not worth it anymore. You just walk away and we had so many hopes 
and dreams that we could do with the house. We envisioned the house being brought back to the way it used to be. And unfortunately, we, we kind of lost our dreams. Lillian remains fearful of the spirits they encountered and chose not to be interviewed. Bill Wallace believes Lillian was being possessed by Abigail, the spirit of a former servant who once worked in the mansion. If looks could kill, I would have joined her on the other side at that moment. That's when I told him that was a very dangerous place to be. I hereby banish all negativity from this space. Historian and paranormal investigator Thomas D. Agostino believes the house has had negative energy almost from the day it was built. S.K. Pierce's first wife had a dream of living in this beautiful home and barely got to live there a year before she passed away. Much like Lillian, who had a dream of moving out of the city to this beautiful home, and they barely lived there a few years before they had to leave as well. We decided to stay with Lillian's sister, and it was like everything was fine again. We felt so much better um, mentally, physically. We were happy again. Hey, I'm going to go swing by the house real quick. Is there anything you need me to get? No, I'm good. I love you. Love you, too. It's been three years since Edwin and Lillian moved out of the Victorian, but even now, they still can't bear to part with it. In the back of my mind, I always hope and pray that, that we can have the house of our dreams back again. That's what we're hoping for.